Hello and welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Medscape video series. I'm Christopher DeSimone, lecture physiologist here at Mayo Clinic. Today we'll be discussing lipid management and enclizerin specifically. And I'm joined by my colleague, Stephen Kopetsky, preventative cardiologist and professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Kopetsky. Thank you, Dr. DeSimone. Well, first of all, can you tell us about how enclizerin works? Yes. Enclizerin is a very interesting drug. It inhibits PCSK9, but not through the way of the standard uh, original uh, drugs we have. This works actually by, it's a small inhibitory RNA molecule drug. So it actually inhibits the RNA from making the PCSK9. Excellent. So different sort of mechanism of action. Right. End results very similar. Now, with the difference in mechanism of action, is there any other effects we see, like any effect on lipoprotein A? Well, there is. Uh, just like we saw with the original PCSK9 inhibitors, about a 20-25% reduction in LPA. Mm, excellent. So we even added benefit from this. Yes. Very good. Now, patients that are on this, does that mean they have to or get to stop their statins, or is that something we keep them on still? No, we do keep them on. In fact, the FDA recommended it in addition to healthy diet, you know, the Mediterranean diet, like we recommend here, and optimal statin therapy or maximum dollarated statin Excellent. therapy. Some of the guidelines actually say give azetamibe, too, with it. So it's more of an additive effect because they have different mechanisms of action. Exactly. And because they have an additive effect, their patients have better outcomes from this? Sure. If you get different mechanisms working together, you can get a better outcome. Because as you get on a statin or the PCSK9 inhibitor drugs, you absorb more cholesterol in your gut. So that's where the azetamibe works. Excellent. So it's kind of like hitting it from two different angles. Yeah, just like blood pressure. You know, we give a vasodilator, a diuretic, a beta yes. blocker. They all work together at lower doses. You can get away. Makes sense. Uh, one thing I think for our audience is how do you take this medicine? Is it a pill? Is it just like a statin medicine? Is it injectable like insulin? Yes, it's very interesting. It's injectable, sub-Q injection, but the kind of the regimen is different. It's a baseline one month, or I'm sorry, baseline three months, and then every six months. Mm. You can check lipids at one month, and you'll start to see a reduction, significant reduction by one month. So then every six months after that, so the adherence, we hope, will be much higher. Excellent. So basically, when they do the injection, they don't have to inject it all the time. It's going to be, you know, once you get on that regimen every six months, sounds much easier than doing something every day. Yes, much easier, and it will be done in the office or in the infusion center. There are infusion centers around the country. We have an infusion center here, as you know, at Mayo Clinic, so we'll know exactly when the patient got the drug, did they get the right dose, because we're doing it all ourselves. Excellent. So it'll be very helpful, to, I think, and it'll help adherence, because we're finding that the PCSK9 inhibitors that are sub-Q injected, self-injected every two weeks, at the end of a year, only about 60% of patients are really still taking those. So we need to increase our, our adherence. You want to increase the adherence because you get so much of a benefit from these drugs, but mm -hmm. patients aren't taking them or no one wants to take shots so frequently, then you won't have good adherence and you won't have good enough outcomes. Exactly. So okay. the less shots, the better the adherence. And when do you check the lipids? So like yeah. when can patients expect a benefit, I guess? Yeah. Well, just like the statins, which will start to see the optimal benefit in four to six weeks, mm -hmm. the same with the, with the enclizeran. Excellent. And then we can check it, you know, yearly after that. Yearly after that. That's nice. Now, what do the FDA or her practice guy then say, yes, this patient, you know, they're on statins, they're tolerating this well, maybe they have some um, additional work they could do with their diet. Mm -hmm. But where does you say this is the patient that would benefit from this? Sure. Maybe not just the patient that's not completely compliant, but needs more. Mm -hmm. Like who would be your ideal patient? Yeah. Well, the FDA has said if you have a heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or heterozygous FH, those that's an indication for the drug. Or if you have ASCVD, you know, cerebrovascular, coronary, or peripheral disease, and you're not at goal, and remember, we haven't talked about this, and but the, the new goals came out just a few weeks ago. So now if you have ASCVD, the goal is 55 milligrams mm -hmm. per deciliter for the LDL, which is a reduction from the 70 it was for the past four years. So that's the ideal patient to give it to. They can't get to goal on a statin, on a zetamibe, on a good diet, on a good, you know, healthy lifestyle then this would be someone to think of adding it in. Excellent. And one other question, you know, sometimes people have issues with statins, as you well know, and sometimes we try different doses or different types of mm -hmm. statins, but side effects from this drug? 
Yeah. Side effects don't seem to be a significant problem. There's always injection site. You know, there's, that's sure. an issue. There is a little bit, just like the PCSK9 inhibitors, every two weeks they get a little nasal stuffiness or you know, bronchitis or rhinitis. The, uh, we're not really seeing any liver problem per se, no infection problems per se. Uh, but again, you know, you study a drug in 20,000, 50,000 patients, then you release it to hundreds of thousands. Right. And so we'll just have to monitor that closely. Sure. But it appears relatively safe. Yes, no, it is quite safe. Excellent. Any issues if someone was to take this um, around pregnancy, things of that nature? Well, it's the same guidelines we have for the other lipid-lowering drugs. We don't want to give during pregnancy, and so I tell patients that are uh, potentially pregnant, let's uh, stop the drugs when you're thinking of getting pregnant, and we can restart them the day after you stop breastfeeding. Got it. And now, in terms of cost of this drug, what, how does someone go about, you know, Obviously, they would see their general practitioner, cardiologist, mm -hmm. and they want to be seen at a specialty clinic, mm -hmm. lipid clinic. Mm -hmm. But how do they go about getting this prescribed, and, and what do patients have to go through? What are their expectations? Yeah, good question. This is a little different in that it's not a drug they go and pick up, get at their pharmacy, right. take it home, put it in the refrigerator. This is one where it's given at the center, at the office. So it's, it's not uh, where the patient brings it in. It's there for them. Mm -hmm. And so the payment structure is a little different. And there's still prior authorization as we're getting more and more with these drugs. Uh, we have to go through that. That's more on our end of things. They do have centers that help us. You know, we have a prior authorization centers that help us. But every, every drug is a little different. And every payer is a little different, too, as you know. And it seems like that also helps the patient know, well, I'm going to go pick this up rather than I'm storing it in the refrigerator or storing it in the cabinet and then helps with that compliance. Yeah, that. they just show up, get the shot. They don't touch the drug. You know, the shot's administered to them and they leave. Excellent. Aside from the shot, anything that you take, tell patients not to take in terms of medicines, do we know of any drug-drug interactions? Yeah, there really don't appear to be any drug-drug interactions. That'll be something that'll have to be studied more, obviously, but we're not, we're not seeing that. Excellent. And then for a patient, what do you tell them what they could expect to benefit? So they're not at goal. And thank you so much for bringing that out, that 70 is not the goal. The new goal is going to be 55 or the goal should be 55. But what does this give the patient? So if we say take this medicine, what is like the reduction in mortality, cardiovascular events? Yeah. Well, you know, the uh, it is interesting. We have great data for the statins and the PCSK9 inhibitors every two weeks. But remember the statins, it was years before we had evidence that we actually lowered mortality when yeah. <laughs> the statins were approved. The same now with Inclizoran. You know, those studies are ongoing, the Orion studies, those will be out in a few years. Mm -hmm. And we all think they will show benefit because they're lowering it by a very similar mechanism, lowering the LDL. So I think they will show benefit clearly. We just don't have the evidence just right sure. now. Sure. So it's kind of like a don't wait for something really good to show up, be on it and if there's low side effects, low risk, and potentially really good benefit, that's something I would offer my patients as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be the convenience issue and the adherence issue that may really make the difference. Sure. It sounds much better to me rather than taking a drug every day. Well, in addition to taking the drug every day, but shots frequently, once yeah. every six months. And, you know, there's a model for that. It's called the osteoporosis drug you know, sure. every a year or so. Yeah. We have a lot of patients, the snowbirds fly up, they get their shot, they fly back down in the exactly. winter. You know, they're, they're happy with that. Exactly. Anything else important about the drug or things coming down the pipeline, the differences of this drug or stuff for patients to know or even our, our uh, cardiologists, primary care? Yeah, for these drugs, you know, we're starting to see the less frequency is, is starting to be the, the name of the game with this. We're starting to see drugs come along that will actually lower lipoprotein A. That's a whole different set of drugs. But now, these drugs that we're talking about today will lower it 20, 25 percent. The new ones will probably lower at 70, 75 percent. Wow. So we have something to look forward to in the Impressive. next few years. Impressive. But we're always trying to get what's best for our patients as soon as we can. Making oh, exactly. Sure safety exactly. Profile. And the one thing to, to remind patients, it's not just about, you know, the pill and not just about the shot. It's also about the lifestyle. We can't say, OK, this shot will replace a healthy lifestyle. That doesn't happen, Chris. We haven't developed that Agreed. yet. Agreed. So patients need to eat healthy and, and do the things that they, we tell them that it really can help their life. That's its own pill. And it's exactly. shot in itself. Exactly. exactly. Well, thank you, Steve, for these very important insights. And thank you for joining us on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology Seminar. 